Hello to the Tango Appreciating Community and welcome back to Drago's Tango Alley. This is your host Alejandro Drago and this is, as promised, the second video of the series dedicated to Piazzolla's six tango etudes for flute or violin. This video will be dedicated to the second etude. And before we proceed to analyze and uh, look look into it a little deeper, I would like to point out that um, of the six etudes, this is the one in which perhaps the recommendation by the author about um, trying to imitate the manner of phrasing and performance of the bandoneon while playing these etudes applies the most. Um, there are two uh, prominent features of this etude number one. Uh, that um, make the bandoneon reference particularly relevant. One is the ornamentations. If you look at the music, you will notice that uh, the core of the etude, uh, with the exception of uh, the central part and some minor sections, uh, consists of long notes. Um, and most of the notes are part of some uh, Q-note figure or ornamentation figure. Uh, how to play those and how to make them fit into the overall fabric of this etude is one of the challenges. Um, and to that end, we will uh, discuss some harmonic analysis of this etude in, in a moment. Um, the second uh, important feature that, as I said, makes the Bandoneon reference relevant is sound production itself. So here, um, in my opinion, uh, the violinist, since we are aiming these videos chiefly to violinists, uh, not exclusively, but chiefly, uh, needs to find a way to bridge between um, Bandoneon uh, styles and practices and violin styles and practices to obtain an ideal phrasing, particularly in that part of the etude that, as I said, consists of mostly long hold, uh, I'm sorry, held notes, um, um, separated by, uh, so to say, flurry of, of ornamentation figures. Um, so in that regard, I would like to give you a little bit of context. Um, I think that um, as far as sound production, um, as far as we are concerned with sound production, um, I think a very good reference uh, would be a tune by Piazzolla that is not very uh, well known. It's called La Felure. It's from his Italian period, um, so roughly the same time when he wrote Oblivion um, and other things in that period. I think that was in the early 70s uh, when he was working in Rome. And uh, there is this fantastic recording. Uh, it's a two-minute piece for violin and bandoneon. Um, with elements of imitation and canon, well, uh, more like antiphonal uh, style, but anyway. And um, the treatment of the sound is so characteristic uh, that I will place um, a link in the, uh, in the reference section. <clears throat> Now, in terms of the ornamentation, in my own doctoral dissertation, I elaborated quite a lot on how uh, Piazzolla's style of ornamentation is akin to Baroque ornamentation and specifically to the Italian school, in, not in an exclusive manner, but 
I felt that the way um, Baroque Italian theoreticians described and classified uh, and systematized ornamentation was quite applicable to the way Piazzolla uh, would elaborate uh, ornamentally on his own uh, work. However, here I would like to leave for you a couple of links. One, and this may be a little bit unexpected, but you need to understand that uh, Piazzolla was a big admirer of Bach and a big uh, scholar and a student of the works of Bach. In fact, he, he played the entire um, old, old uh, tempered clavier on the bandoneon. Uh, in, in fact, his in, in beginnings on the bandoneon were on Bach material. So what I want to say is that it would be interesting to take a look at Bach's chromatic fantasy for harpsichord. Um, and the uh, string players would be very well served to look into a fantastic transcription of this piece made by Zoltan Kodai, the, the great uh, Hungarian composer, for solo viola. Um, I think that uh, the chromatic fantasy and Kodai's transcription uh, illustrate quite well some elements of the manner in which we should play uh, the ornamentations in Etude Number no. 2 by Piazzolla. Uh, so I will add links to all these materials in the reference section below the video. <clears throat> uh, so um, the, etudes, it, the Etude is in a big ABA uh, section. Um, and I felt that it was important to offer you some form of harmonic analysis. I will go into some lengths uh, in the analysis of section A, um, because most of those harmonies are uh, merely implied by the ornamentation, not by the main notes. You will see that in a minute. Um, and uh, I will also... Uh, go briefly through the middle section. Um, but uh, there is something I need to uh, get out of the way before I will be criticized by both uh, jazz and pop music players and academic um, theoretics and musicologists. First of all, this analysis is meant not to be exhaustive. That would be, well, exhausting to do. Um, first. And second, uh, the difficulty of the task is not even the main reason I didn't go into it, but rather because I consider that in this etude, the harmonic hearing of it, being as it is an etude that doesn't have a single double note, it's partially a matter of willing hearing of certain harmonies. You somehow need to choose to hear certain harmonies. Uh, harmonic um, uh, outlines are at most strongly suggested, never fully um, spelled out. So uh, that's uh, the main reason. But there is another one. And the next reason, which will be more evident, uh, particularly in the central section, is that some harmonies do not have uh, a real functional role. So they are not entirely functional harmonies. They are coloristic harmonies. So there is quite a lot of um, harmonic planning. Okay? So um, perhaps I could have undertaken, I mean, this is pretty uh, heavy-duty theoretical stuff. I could have undertaken uh, a neo-Riemannian analysis of it. Uh, it would have been fascinating, but I don't really think it would have had any real practical uh, consequences for the performer. So I wanted to make uh, those uh, caveats, to express those caveats, uh, before going into the harmonic analysis of section A and section uh, the central section B. So let's proceed. Well, here we are with the harmonic analysis. Um, I've been forced to do this in a different software than the one I wanted to do it on. Uh, but uh, hopefully this will deliver enough quality. Um, the piece uh, starts with a naked C. And it's only natural to assume that 
uh, the piece is going to be in C major or minor. Uh, further, the arpeggios that appear with which feature uh, C major seventh and C ninth uh, and eventually C major uh, seems to reassure us in that regard. So uh, it would seem logical to assume that this is uh, a tonic, right? So that would be C major or C minor. Uh, but later on we have um, clearly a temporary uh, tonic in A minor. So if we were to retrospectively interpret this as being in um, uh, A minor, we may as well assume that we started on the third uh, minor degree of uh, in, in A minor, actually it should be major, it, that's my mistake here. Um, now, I believe we have very good reasons to assume that the piece or the main tonal center of the piece is actually E minor. So I will be offering also a functional reading for E minor, in which case this C would be um, a sixth uh, step in E minor. Uh, now, uh, my initial idea was to simply indicate the tonality and draw a line here. Um, because really, any uh, implication beyond the fact that this is C comes from the use of these Q notes here and here, right? Um, so, I don't think we should put that much stake um, on a um, detailed voice analysis here. Uh, something is going around the pitch of C and the tonality of C. What is it? Well, we are out to find out, right? Um, here, clearly, there is a suggestion of E minor. Uh, if you filter out some non-tonality notes, and this line just describes a chromatic connection between these two notes. Um, then again, it's quite difficult and probably absolutely necessary to ascribe any uh, tonal or functional reading to it. More interestingly now, we arrive at, that, at this uh, diminished chord. Um, again, this can be read functionally in a number of ways. Perhaps the easiest one would be to consider it a diminished chord, seventh chord of the seventh step in E minor, uh, just inverted, uh, third inversion. Um, again, uh, this uh, is not fundamental. Uh, the interesting part of it is this extra B natural here that adds a certain ambiguity and hints to a dominant function as is more clear from here. Again, this is somehow of a wishful reading of this section uh, since there is no particular emphasis on this G sharp. We can interpret this E flat as a G sharp, right? Um, perhaps the most important thing of this analysis is uh, not so much to establish a functional relationship uh, for every aspect and every, every uh, element of the fabric, but rather to sense how there are cycles of two bars that have roughly some sort of tonal connection in some sort of tonal progression that will eventually lead to E minor. So if we were to hear this so far reduced to harmonies, I did an electronic version, and this is the sound we get. We 
can uh, observe again in the next four bars uh, what seems to be uh, a simple cadential modulation to A minor. So you remember that on the fourth bar we ended on some sort of B major, D major seventh or uh, D sharp diminished seventh chord, all of which hint to a double dominant to A minor. Uh, so it's only logical that you have after that uh, a function like this one, let's see, yes, there we go. That again uh, starts as a diminished chord but clarifies later on as a dominant chord to A minor. And eventually we land on the A minor zone. Although with some interesting additions such as this F tone here, uh, something that is very characteristic of some styles of uh, jazz harmonization and was certainly very characteristic of Piazzolla. Um, uh, that would merit like a separate analysis. Now, please note again here that I simply annotated a line for this chromatic sequence and how to play it uh, will be a, a another discussion. Please also note that between the B and the G-sharp here, so the um, harmonically meaningful notes, there is like a feeling of chromatic notes. On the violin, this could be played, and in my opinion, should be played almost as a quasi-glissando. Unlike these, which have distinct articulation marks, so there are specific tango manners of playing that. We will go over that. Um, so finally, we are, uh, let's clean this one too. Uh, finally, we are on the A minor zone, which strikes as a tonic of sorts. And the ending passage is not a chromatic one, but rather an arpeggio with some added notes. However, we will soon see that not only a minor is not our final destination, but also that this added F tune uh, had an important role to play. Okay, uh, I noticed that uh, we didn't hear the previous four bars in the audio ver version, so let's hear them now. Notice the A minor first inversion chord with the added F. That F actually receives a certain development here by uh, moving it to F sharp, which we can see here. Well, of course, once I remove that <laughs> arrow, um, and we have a half diminished core that uh, more neatly ties into the E minor tonality. Um, we have this semi-chromatic sequence here in which nevertheless we find this specific uh, diminished chord here. And this is a good moment to point out something. Uh, the choice of E minor as a central tonality uh, is a little bit of a paradox in the case of the flute version because the lowest note of the flute or most flutes at least the standard flute is this C and that uh, prevented Piazzolla from using this B natural okay I hope you can see it clearly as a dominant tone to E and we will see that, uh, well, for example, here, when uh, it would have been much more logical to lead this line down to a B and then resolve into E minor, right? Uh, I, I should have added minor here, but anyway. Um, well, uh, on the violin, that wouldn't be a problem, but that would force us to add notes that are not in the music, which is not a good thing, I guess. 
So um, here we have a clear resolution into E minor. I should say minor here. Oh. Well, the pencil is not working very well, but you know what I mean, it's E minor. And since uh, this is just simply a movement of the base without change of the function, I didn't see the need to analyze this as a half diminished seventh core and whatnot. Um, as for the tonality of this, uh, for last part, it is, oh yeah, sorry, um, to correct this. There we go. It is fairly clear uh, from this pitch collection. So let's move on. As for the section after this establishment of the E minor, I decided not to analyze it because it is essentially a parallel uh, motion of uh, either diminished chords or depending on what added tones you get, you may hear a minor ninth, seventh chord in like third inversion. Uh, this has um, a rather coloristic effect. In other words, uh, whatever tonal tensions uh, are generated by these main chords, added notes and melodic tones, they are uh, somehow encapsulated within each of those zones and they don't really relate functionally to each other. Um, let's just briefly hear the um, electronic version of the sound file, uh, reduced two chords. within the chord. And then he goes from uh, the E flat to B and uh, the repeat happens from uh, the beginning until we hit the uh, second ending. Well, uh, let's assume we repeat it and now we jump to the um, second repeat. Um, we have this essentially E minor chord with a sixth, which of course is a C sharp, uh, have diminished seventh chord in first inversion. But since the E is at the root, there's a strong feeling uh, of tonality there. Um, also, it starts moving away by the addition, oops, uh, by the addition of the C sharp and the F sharp. As for this passage here, um, well, this is uh, one of the examples of what I, I was dubbing as a willing hearing to the point that I just mark it with a question mark. Um, I am willing to hear that chord as an E minor chord, um, but uh, is it really? I mean, the only diatonic steps here are these three um, and it ends on a G natural, so that would indicate uh, some sort of connection with E minor. Still, I don't insist on that analysis. I take it just as an example of uh, how ambiguous this can be sometimes. So let's hear that, uh, those two bars. So here we go uh, with uh, what seems to be uh, different versions of F sharp minor uh, with the major seventh and with minor seven. Again, another indication of uh, the coloristic nature of harmony here. Harmony in the case of this chord is mostly inferred, oh, sorry. Uh, from the pitch collection of this uh, passage, right? Um, and here we enter something very interesting. Let me see if I can move my own 
image to here. Um, oh, sorry. As we approach the central section, which is going to be in G-sharp minor, we definitely need some tonal clarity. This chord here seems to be um, like a, a strange uh, inversion of a C-sharp minor chord, which definitely in G-sharp minor would be a fourth step, so from the subdominant group, leading logically to a dominant and uh, then to a tonic, right? Um, but then again, the bass is a non-chord note. Uh, or if you want to think of it as a, a minor, C-sharp minor chord with a ninth and the ninth on the bass, then again, uh, I won't insist uh, on trying to narrow down the chord to a, to a very specific uh, functional structure because to be honest, it doesn't have it beyond being a sort of subdominant color before this pitch collection. Now, this chord here, this chord doesn't exist. I wrote it. And I wrote it because it's the only reasonable and functional harmony that can be accompany these notes in order to make sense of the central section of what follows in terms of tonality and tonal center. Let's hear this section. back to my uh, standard software. Hopefully it will hold now. We'll see if I can get it fixed for the next part of this video because I really feel that I need to split this video in two. It's too long. Uh, so I will finish the analysis part here as promised and I will touch uh, briefly upon the um, uh, central section which you should be about uh, to see on your screen. Um, basically, uh, you have some major uh, tonal centers, centers here um, that you see indicated in blue uh, little squares or cartouche, if you're a fan of Egyptology, <clears throat> like the royal names. So G minor, uh, uh, G sharp minor, I'm sorry, it goes through a particular sequence to F sharp minor. It essentially repeats and extends that sequence to settle for a B minor tonic, briefly shifting to C sharp minor, but coming back to B minor. Um, there are um, enrichments and variations of the main chords, but um, I, I thought uh, the really important aspect was to indicate the main tonal centers. Um, now, if we move to the next slide, which should be now uh, on your screen. Um, after a little coma, we have the tristement, the uh, sad uh, final section of the central section. I uh, didn't put it there, but uh, we are still in B minor. And as the section progresses, the harmonies become less and less functional. So I had to use a different color to write them in. There is some suggestion of functionality for some of the harmonies, but other than evident tonic dominant relationships, the tonality seems to be crumbling and drifting away here. In fact, the last two bars don't even use chords in the strict sense. Uh, those are 5-4 um, uh, pitch sets that do not contain thirds, so you cannot define them as chords. So tonality um, and functional tonality seems to be uh, fading away as you approach the end of this section, which leads to the re-exposition, which is essentially identical with the exception of one bar in which the tonality is defined differently um, uh, in the ornamentation notes. 
you should be seeing it right now. Otherwise, and other than that, and the coda, uh, the sections A and A prima are identical. In the coda, we have a combination of fourths uh, with chromatic runs and uh, probably you will be seeing it now, uh, this funny thing of the last note being a C natural when obviously you should have a B natural to give a proper dominant tonic effect and uh, underscore properly the tonic nature of that latest E at the end of the work. But alas, the, fl the flute doesn't have it. Um, so we can rationalize uh, suggesting that Piazzolla wanted to introduce an ambiguity there. I think just the flute didn't have that note. So with this, I will leave the analysis part and the first video as is. And tomorrow, hopefully with full use of my software, I will pick the violin and show to you some important concepts uh, as far as sound production is concerned in the performance of this etude. You have a great day. See you tomorrow.